a time, we're going to quickly shift now. Um, so the next speaker, oh my goodness, has also been a part of my journey from the very, 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 very beginning. He was one of those silent supporters that I, I could lean on. All I had to do was tell John, John, I need to connect with this person. And John would be like, here's the email. Here's the introduction. John was that guy. And I have so many stories to say. I want to use this opportunity to say thank you, John. But I also want other people to connect with John because he is known very much in the political cycle in Washington, D.C. He's a Washington lobbyist. And he also served in, at Pentagon. And I like to tell him, I don't even want to know what you used to do there, John. Uh, but John, it's such an honor to call you my friend and um, be able to share your story today. So yes, he's traveling and he actually had to drive off the road to do this. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough, John. So you have the floor, John. Yeah, I know you so well, but I, I had no idea you were a doctor. So that was, uh, that was a... Honorary doctor. Eye-opening. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one thing I'm struck by, just uh, diving in here, is technology. Yeah, I'm driving across country here instead of um, flying, I guess for obvious reasons. Uh, I got kind of a late start in Washington yesterday. But here I've been this morning listening to all of you on this uh, wonderful uh, platform you set up. Uh, unfortunately, I did not get to hear you yesterday. But uh, yeah, I get to pull over in a rest area here, nice and quiet. Trees, there was a cardinal in the tree here just a minute ago. And so it's so nice to be plugged in. I, I'd rather be with you all in Chicago in person. And especially as a lobbyist, you know, meeting people face to face is crucial. And that's one thing I'm missing in reflecting upon these times with COVID, uh, missing the embassy events, uh, missing going to think tank events. I was supposed to have been back in Africa in March. Here I am in West Virginia right now instead. Uh, but, you know, I was happy to see the, uh, the judge somewhat dressed up here as well. I went out of my way. <laughs> I'm supposed to be this influential lobbyist. I didn't want to be wearing Bob Marley t-shirt and shorts in presentation. So I, I put on my Washington DC suit just for you guys. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I'll probably switch back since I've been a rest area right uh, when we're concluded here. But uh, okay, so President elect Joe Biden, what's no. the... <laughs> What's the landscape going to look like? This is a parlor game we play every four years in Washington. It doesn't matter if uh, we're coming into a second term of a presidency or a first term. And I don't think I'm going out on much of a limb here by saying Joe Biden's going to be the next president. Could be wrong. I'm wrong quite a lot. But again, we, we play this game every four years. So what does it mean? How is, uh, how is the engagement going to change internationally and with Africa and it seems to be the same wish list every four years. And I've written the same articles myself. We have to do this, should do that, should focus more on this. We have to do more trade. And frankly, nothing much really ever happens. And I wouldn't expect that under a Biden, there would be any kind of golden age US-Africa relations. I think we'd just kind of go on like we are. And that's despite having high profile Africa policy people uh, actually under consideration now for vice president with Susan Rice. And uh, I was surprised to see Karen Bass, although I think I'm understanding that she's kind of fallen off that list this past week or so. Uh, Karen Bass, wonderful person. I, I've engaged with her a bit more with her staff. I've engaged with her on uh, Capitol Hill through the years. I had the pleasure of representing Kenya, uh, lobbying on their behalf a couple of years ago. I was technically working with Amina Muhammad, the foreign minister at that time, who was now up to be the head of the director of the World Trade Organization, which is exciting on two counts. One, because she's a friend, 
two, she's a female, and three, she's African. We've never had a female nor an African as head of the World Trade Organization. So that could be exciting. But yeah, I was in Kenya uh, on behalf of my client at the time during their last round of elections and interacted with Karen Bass there. And I, I think she would make, uh, I would like to see her in some increased capacity working on Africa, whether it's Secretary of State. My guess is Kamala Harris is gonna be the vice presidential pick. And that would be my pick too. I just sense that that's a winning ticket. And that would leave Susan Rice perhaps in a Secretary of State role. You know, again, these are all parlor games. Who knows what's going to happen? But to think we're going to have any kind of increased attention to Africa just because this change in administration, this change in personalities, probably not. Uh, don't forget the Congress. Very important. I think the Democrats might take the Senate. Again, who knows? Uh, definitely going to hold on to the House of Representatives. In the Senate, the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is a senator who never had much of a background in foreign policy, Senator Risch. Uh, the Democrats in taking control, that would be uh, Senator Menendez taking over that important committee. And his big focus, certainly not going to be Africa, is going to be fixing a lot of the damage that's been done State Department, American diplomacy. He, he talks a lot about that. So I think that would be his focus. But one consistent thing we have is very, very, very fine staff. Doesn't matter if it's Republican or Democrat, both in the House and in the Senate. And I wouldn't expect big changes there either. On the House side, Congressman, maybe I'm getting too in the weeds here politically for you, but this is what I do. Uh, Congressman Elliot Engel lost his primary race, so he will be out as a kind of a shocker on the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. There are three contenders for that right now. The top one would be uh, Brad Sherman of California. I think he will probably end up winning that. Uh, the other contenders are Joaquin Castro of Texas and Greg Meeks, the uh, Black Caucus member from New York. I'll just, I won't, I won't dwell on this for long, but None of them really have an Africa focus. Brad Sherman's big thing is the uh, Iran deal. He was very much against that. And just right there, that tells you right, right away what you know, American foreign policy, where the focus is. It's, it's always gonna be on North Korea. It's gonna be on Iran. It's gonna be Ukraine. It's gonna be this or that. Castro, his big thing is the Palestinians. Uh, Greg Meeks, despite being a Black Caucus member, his focus is on NATO. Uh, I'll just as, as a quick aside, just because someone's a member of the Black Caucus does not mean they're automatically by default. It's like Obama, because of their heritage, that they're going to have a big interest in Africa. Well, it's not the case. In fact, traditionally, the Black Caucus doesn't have much of an interest at all. It's uh, many, many years ago when I started out in Washington, there was a Congressman Dimely from, uh, God, was he from California? Uh, he had a he led the Africa committee, subcommittee. He had an interest. The late, great John Lewis, wonderful, wonderful man. I interacted with him a few times. Uh, I used to live and work, uh, work in Angola during the Civil War. And when I would return home to Washington, I would on occasion brief Congressman Lewis on the situation in Angola. It, it, it always struck me, it's hard to verbalize this disconnect between Africans in America, the, Af the Black Caucus, and the relationship with the continent itself. But yeah, Congressman Lewis had listened to my, my updates, my briefing, and, but he never had a foreign policy portfolio. But anyway, yeah, so getting back to the House, I don't see any big changes there. Congressman Chris Smith, uh, Republican from New Jersey, has always been the, the kind of a steady force in the House of Representatives when it comes to African affairs. And uh, he, he's been very good. Okay, uh, where am I going next? 
the continuity, I just scribbled some notes here on my picnic table for, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't come prepared. There's, there's a continuity when it comes to US Africa policy. And that's whether it's in Congress or with the presidencies. And I've written of this before, you know, say going back to Father Bush, his policies with South Africa and apartheid, the ensuing administrations kept those policies. Bill Clinton, I was there with the early days of AGOA and the setting up. I had nothing to do with it. It's just that I knew a lot of the people that were putting that together. Excellent, excellent program. And I know you, Toyin, in many of our discussions, you're always talking about how people don't know about AGOA, whether it's in Africa or here. I mean, it's startling to me every four years how I'm hearing uh, politicians and players here have no idea about AGOA and just how, what that has meant. And, but the point I'm making is every administration since has kept AGOA vital. It's still good until, what, 2025, I believe. And then, uh, oddly enough, George W. Bush is probably the best Africa president we've had in my lifetime, our lifetimes. A, an abject failure in almost everything else, whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, Hurricane Katrina, the economy, but he was a good Africa president. PEPFAR, setting up a Millennium Challenge was not just Africa, I mean, it's a global thing, but it, Africa has been a large recipient of Millennium Challenge uh, funding. It was a good model. Those, those institutions that he laid down are still in place. President Obama came in with uh, Energy Africa. That remains. Trump, I see Trump as somewhat of a continuation of the Obama administration. There's, again, it's just, there's not much interest there. Uh, the, 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 the institutions have been reshuffled a bit for this prosper Africa, but that's how I see it. It's just really a reshuffling of names. Uh, it's nice to have these monies there available for Africa, but you know, again, a lot of the Africans aren't aware of this. And that's where people like me, the lobbyists come in. So what I'll do here is quickly uh, go over the American political scene. I've just completed that. I'll talk a bit about US policy in Africa and then I'll conclude just in talking a bit about lobbying itself. I was gonna talk about security, but I don't, I don't wanna go on too long. Toyin and I have these conversations all the time about just how disengaged the United States is in Africa. And I know many of you have voiced this already today and rightfully so. Uh, you know, we're not even in the rearview mirror of China anymore when it comes to engagement with Africa. It seems like just yesterday to someone like me who's been active in this space for over three decades, uh, it just it seemed like yesterday when China was kind of on par with us, just a little bit behind. And yeah, we're not even in their rear view mirror anymore. And even though their trade has kind of fallen off a bit, it's still just a speed bump. Uh, a lot of the Africans that I'm hearing from are getting a little bit tired of China. Well, let's face it, they're not gonna go away. They would like some counterbalance and that's where the United States should come in if it were to step forward in a proper way but uh, we're just not taking advantage of those opportunities. Turkey is the, the country that's really impressed me. And I don't know if maybe you've had discussions on this yesterday or maybe I missed something this morning, but uh, Turkey and Erdogan is just is jaw dropping. The effort they've put into Africa, unlike any other medium sized country. Of course, a part of that is history. A part of that is geography, they're close by. But Erdogan has just said, I don't know how many trips to Africa. Just last week or two weeks ago, the foreign minister was in Africa again. He was in uh, Togo, Equatorial Guinea, and was it Mali? Mali or Niger? Niger. Uh, bringing along Turkish construction companies and uh, aviation sector interests and yeah, they have a political agendas, of course, uh, with these religious schools and the like. But, wow, they're up to, what, 40 
two embassies now, or maybe no more than that, because they just opened one in Equatorial Guinea. Just uh, Turkey is really a good model. Uh, so I've been following them a lot. And there's other countries like normally don't think of like uh, Vietnam, Malaysia that I've been tracking. It's very active in Africa. The French had fallen off, unfortunately. I think uh, it has hurt them, uh, both politically and from a, from a business standpoint, how they have kind of fallen off the scene, but now they're trying to re-engage. Germany has never been much of a player. Uh, they're starting to pay closer attention to it. But anyway, here's all these countries now. You know, Turkey is pretty close now to the US when it comes to trade. Uh, that's, that's crazy, it's crazy. Uh, Toyin, you speak a lot about, I think if I were to jump to one of my conclusions at this point in the conversation, I'll just say, it's, yeah, it's a lot of it's PR. Uh, the Africans don't know how to really access the United States and these markets so much, and American business certainly is not thinking much in terms of Africa, unless you're the GEs of this world and the like. Lobbying, uh, my, my business, oh, I love this line of work, I really do. Uh, lobbyists are kind of like the used car salesmen of politics. I mean, that's unfortunate. Uh, part of that's deserve it, I know, but uh, you, you look at, especially in this administration, uh, the Manafort stories, General Flynn and the like, and uh, yeah, it can get complicated. But on the other hand, I've had the pleasure of working like with the Kenyans, assisting them with issues like getting uh, airline flights. Other countries, I don't just work with Africa, but that's my focus. Say even little Iceland, they had an issue with Iceland Air, a uh, problem that needed resolving. I like. I like helping. New Zealand had a visa issue. Who would think New Zealand of all countries has an issue, had an issue with visas with the United States? And they did, and uh, I was happy to help. So it's not all this dirty politics and under the table kind of dealings, but, uh, but it is a complicated landscape. And one of the mistakes that Africans make well, all around the world, but is going with these big firms, the biggest of the big firms in Washington. You know, by and large, they promise a lot of this and that and this and that, fancy, fancy talk and a lot of big contracts. And this is a, this is, might be kind of awkward, but I'm being very frank here. When it comes to Africa, there's always an attitude with the biggest of the big firms of, uh, yeah, we'll come in, just pay us, and then they'll pat you on the head, give you a cookie, tell you to go away, and then they'll put some junior staff on the, on the assignment, 24-year-olds, uh, coming up with these big long lists of things that look impressive on paper. They're going to Karen Bass's office and then uh, you know, they, they called this assistant secretary of that and this and that. And, yeah, here's $2,000 more you owe us because, you know, we wrote this letter to Commerce Department. And then you hear it from the Africans all the time. Well, paying all this money and nothing's getting done. Well, it's just it's, it's it's john it's it's quite complex i think that's this the landscape is complex but the reason um i think this conversation is important is because on the surface right you know in the news and the media i think it's oversimplified and when we look at the trade data you see a decline in u.s africa trade some of the things we're sharing really unveils it seems, you know what's going on behind where why there seem not to be enough but one thing i can also say that is happening um I, i'm not sure if you're for, i'm sure you're following pretty much what the us is trying to accomplish with kenya 
um, right now and then with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. I, I, see, I see movements, I see some con conversations happening. And um, I, I also joined the call from two weeks ago where Rahama with the PAC DBA where I, I, I jowled into that call. So I see conversation. I think one of the questions I have would be, what should the um, African private sector, should, what should they be thinking about? What should it be? Um, what should African government be doing? Because one thing that is is not happening, um, or what what is happening is, a lot of the African government are saying, if you want to deal with us, come to us. But is there a role that the African government? What could they be doing better? I guess what could they be doing better to advance trade, to come to the table from a place of strength? Um, you know, five, 10 years from now, what would you like to see differently in the political engagement? And also, how do you bring um, the business side of uh, the American business side into the game? I don't know. These are always the, the kind of things that you know more about. And we've had these discussions uh, at length for a long time. And we always end up, it's not, again, it's not like a chicken or egg kind of uh, thing like I saw in Iraq, Afghanistan. Can you have, can you have, uh, can you have a legal system without security? Can you have security without a legal system? It's not quite that. But without the political foundations, without the political relations, without the, the security guarantees, you can't really have trade. the trade in the way that you're always talking about. <laughs> so that's really how I approach it. Cause I, I don't know. I mean, there's always these trade missions from the States here and how can African governments, you know, they send trade missions too. Like you were just talking with Arkansas and Iowa. And I've always been kind of dubious on those. They, sometimes they, they're successful. Sometimes they're just, they make for good publicity, but I don't know. These are, these kind of questions are more in your court. And that's why in our conversations, we always, I always get back to the politics. I always get back to the national security and you're talking about the trade, <laughs> but you can't have one without the other, without the, the government relations. Yes. And yes. certainly Kenya, because it, it's one of the anchors in the US Africa policy. And uh, you have a, a guest here from, from Ghana. And that, that's another one that I think should play a higher profile and has historically been you know, very, very close, a good model, a good entry point for the United States and Africa. We were always talking about gateways to Africa. And, uh, well, we have 54 countries now, but there are certain ones like Kenya and Ghana that are just natural friends of the United States and we have the historic links and they should be kind of at the forefront of uh, as models moving ahead, whether it's trade or government relations. You, you, you know, John, for me, it feels like people are listening to the private conversations you and I have. <laughs> We're giving people the privilege to, to see the dynamics between myself coming from the business side and saying, trade, 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 let's go. And you, and and you say, Tori, wait, wait, what of security? What of uh, politics? You know, so... <laughs> And for all of you listening, Toyin is always so upbeat and positive. I'm kind of the opposite. I'm always downcast and <laughs> cynical, but I have reason to be. Uh, we all want Africa, U.S.-Africa relations, trade to thrive. I mean, we want to see the continent thrive. And I'll, I guess I'll close on this, uh, just again, getting back to security. You know, 10 years ago, we we're all marveling at how all these legacy conflicts in Africa have kind of faded away. These things, oh, Angola, I referenced earlier, where I spent a great deal of time, on and on and on and on, have uh, had kind of receded. And Africa was really looking like, uh, wow, it turned the corner and what a bright future because uh, these internal and external conflicts have kind of receded. Well, here we are again. All of a sudden, we're looking at major Hor potential for horrible conflicts. Egypt talking about moving into Libya, which frankly they don't have they don't have the military set up to do expeditionary missions like that. Egypt going to war with Ethiopia over this dam issue, and uh, 
this is something that's been going on for 10 years. Why couldn't they have sorted these issues out by now? Now they're starting to fill the dam up apparently. And Mozambique, uh, Northern Mozambique, uh, just the conflict never seems to end there. I mean, Bernamo is still on, uh, ongoing in the center of the country. And in the North, you have external influences like from the Gulf. Uh, the DRC is in a constant state of flux and yeah, we, all this optimism from 10 years ago, it's just, uh, there, oh, I haven't even mentioned the Sahel, which actually is the biggest focus right now of the U.S. It sort of plays off from the Libya question, but uh, so how can we have all this trade? How are the African leaders uh, going to deal with trade with the United States or wherever? Are putting together this free trade, this continental free trade zone, with these massive conflicts ready to break out. Again, chicken or egg, somewhat. Fantastic. There's a, there's a question for you. I thought I was the only one enjoying this, but it, it looks like you have a question. Um, Davisha Johnson asks, how do politicals, um, that's good, get hired by Africa government for lobbying on behalf of Africa. What do you mean, someone like me? Right, I, I think she's asking, I, I really don't have much background. So um, how do African governments hire somebody like you? Um, that's the way I'm reading this question. It, right? it, takes a, it takes a lot of work on my part. Again, you know, the, frankly, you have to be on the ground in Africa. Again, that's why this COVID thing is, uh, hurting. Uh, although lobbying itself, I'll tell you this, is exploding right now. Uh, domestic lobbying and uh, foreign, it's, it's, it's just exploding. But you know you can't close deals with Africans without being in pick a capital, any capital. You can't do it. Same with the Middle East. There are other regions of the globe like Asia, yeah, where you can kind of do a video thing like this or some calls and you can conclude business. Europe, East Europe, you, 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 you kind of have to have drinks with people to close deals in person. But uh, yeah, it's hard work on my, beh on my behalf, uh, reaching out and looking for business. Uh, I, I, I think um, something I can also add that you do really well, that I, I don't think people understand that you, you have to be very good with relationships um, you have to be generous because it, it might be a relationship you've built a year, two years before it actually um, generates any business revenue. And, you know, while people are listening, I also want to say thank you, even for me personally, the way you've supported me. I remember um, a few years ago when, you know, um, Donny Smith, we were preparing for the first edition of Trade with Africa Business Summit. And I was talking to him as an investor and I said, I want you to be my keynote speaker. What would you like to see as an investor, as a CEO? And he said to him, we need an economist, right? We need an economist to tell us as CEO, why Africa, where is Africa going economic, economically? And I said, okay, you want me to get an economist? Where would I get that from? You know, one thing that then happened was I reached out to you and I said, John, John, um, World Bank economist, like where would I get that? You know, we need them at our event. And one beautiful thing that John did said, John did was, and I'm, I, I know I'm going public, public here, is he told me, he said, Tony, I'm, in a, I'm currently in a meeting right now where the chief economist for, the World, for Africa at the World Bank is speaking. Let me see if I can get him for you. Few minutes later, you took a screenshot of his business card and say, here you go, Tony. Here's his contact. I, already, <laughs> I told him he'll be expecting you. And I was like, what? John, you are amazing. So, so to that question, Dafisha, what I'll tell you that John does absolutely well is he knows how to network. He knows how to build partnerships and he does it in a very extremely generous way. So that's something I want to encourage people to do. Whatever, whatever business you're in really, whether you're lobbying or whatever, if you're looking to, business is done at the speed of relationship, right? The ability to, and I don't know if John, if you want to speak a little bit to that, but I have seen you practice it with me. I've seen you practice it and, and th that's, that's a winning source in terms of treating people with generosity, showing up 
and um, and 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 being present, showing up to well, those events as well. You know, when I opened, I said how much I love this line of work, and I do. I just, it's awesome. And uh, not all the countries that I'm paying attention to. I was actually going to go through what I'm paying attention to now, but uh, I have to hit the road here again. But uh, t take Mauritius for example. That was mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, that's a place I've been eyeing quite a lot, but there's really no business there from a lobbying standpoint, but I've made good friends there. And it's just, that's part of what I enjoy is just these connections. Uh, I was sitting down with uh, my friends from the embassy of Georgia, Georgia Republic uh, a while back. And I said to them, you know, Georgia hires a lot of lobbyists too. And I said, you know, odds are we're never going to actually do business together, but I just love this becoming friends with, uh, with you people and drinking your fine Georgian wine and having conversation. And so, yeah, the networking is really crucial. And I'll, I'll close on this. Yeah, I was complaining about the big lobbying firms earlier. And I think it's helpful to have someone who actually knows the continent of Africa and has spent a great deal of time there. And the people that I have with me in connection with me are old established Africa hands that make me look like I'm new, uh, highly talented across a broad swath, uh, cross section of capabilities. And I'm just kind of the advisor and the one who puts the connections together like you were just talking about. So anyway, great to be here uh, from West Virginia. I think I'm gonna be in Ohio in a few minutes. John, I want to say thank you. I want to, I want to publicly say thank you because when this was just an idea, you were one of those, you know, small, small group of believers that pretty much blew strong winds in my sail and say, yay, go for it. We're here. We'll support you, even if it's quietly. But I'm you, glad you, you, you lack energy and enthusiasm. That's the one downside here. <laughs> You're too low key. I'm too low key, right? You know, I remember one thing, one day you said, Toyin, wow, I didn't know you had this much ambition. I knew you were going to do something, but you were like, man, you're an ambitious woman. I was like, okay. <laughs> thank you, John. It's such an honor to call you my friend. And thank you for sharing. Likewise. I'm, I'm going to change into my Bob Marley t-shirt now. So. Thank you for putting up on your nice suit for us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Have a safe trip, John. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be listening. Okay, fantastic. Um, that's why bringing, bringing that conversation into the, the dynamic of this forum today, I felt it was, it, was, it was kind of important for so many people. It might be um, a new, different type of engagement. But just, just keep your mind open in terms of what, what's happening. Um, but for us, the platform is also primarily um, to drive um, trade with Africa. Um, so one of the things we're going to quickly do, we've been here for two days now. I want to also thank those